Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Remember to like and subscribe for more stylish moves next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Bayonetta from the series of games she's from. I can't remember what they're called at the moment. Bayonetta epitomizes so many character tropes. She's impossibly good at everything she does. She's a perpetual fan service motion machine and an amnesiac video game protagonist. Yet she still feels like a unique individual, probably because there aren't many other stories about girls with guns in their shoes and clothing made out of their own hair. Sounds itchy. I Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need magical weapons and the ability to be instantly good with all of them. Next, we need a set of armor that is always ready to go, maybe attached to our scalp or something. Finally, we'll get the ability to slow our enemies to make them easy combo food. For stats, we're using the standard point array from the player's handbook, and starting off, Bayo should have every ability score at about 20. She's strong, quick, tough, smart, intuitive, and charming, but rules are rules, so we'll focus on getting the scores we need for the abilities that we need. Charisma's number one here it's your casting modifier and yeah she's hot let's not beat around the bush dexterity next sliding evading and shooting are all important your livelihood depends on your livelihood constitution after that you need a lot of concentration and fight literal gods so you need to be pretty tough follow that up with intelligence your knowledge of angels and demons makes you a pain in the ass for them figuratively and literally wisdom is a little low i'd really only want it for perception so we'll make sure perception is good and i'll dump strength the girl can yeet a car but i'm chalking it up to magic which we have. For race, I think Bayonetta is technically a human, but forget that. She's got floaty wings and hopefully nobody will mind if I make her a fallen Asimar. You get plus two charisma and plus one strength, celestial resistance to resist necrotic and radiant damage, the light bearer ability for the light cantrip, 60 feet of dark vision, and healing hands to restore an amount of HP equal to your level as an action to creatures you touch. Don't let that info get out though, people will break their arms just to get a pat on the back from you. Take the soldier background for athletics and intimidation, which wars are still wars, and just because the enemy's life like your sass doesn't mean it's not intimidating. Kick things off as a bard, Bayonetta's fighting style is very similar to dancing. You can grab any three skills you like. Performance, religion, and perception would be my picks. You get bardic inspiration, letting you flirt with an ally to give them a d6. They can add to a d20 roll with one of your bonus actions. You've also got an amount of these equal to your charisma modifier per long rest. For your cantrips, vicious mockery is weaponized sass, forcing a wisdom save of eight plus your proficiency bonus and charisma modifier on an enemy. Dealing one d4 psychic damage to those that fail and making their next attack roll have disadvantage. Mage Hand creates a floating spectral hand that can activate switches or lift objects weighing five pounds or less. Use your hair to try and trigger the trap. No need to get close to it yourself. For your first level spell, Feather Fall protects up to five falling creatures from falling damage, so if you're having a fight on top of a jet, no worries. Disguise Self lets you change your appearance for an hour if you want some angels to think you're a nun. They can see through it with an investigation check against your spell save, but by that time, you're already opening fire. Bane forces a charisma save on up to three creatures Creatures failing it, they subtract a d4 from attack rolls and saving throws for up to a minute, depending on your concentration, making everyone a little bit worse at fighting you. Finally, Long Strider increases your movement speed by 10. Your legs are very long, actually kind of too long. It's a little creepy looking. Second level bards get Song of Rest, letting allies heal an extra d6 on short rests. Sing Fly Me to the Moon, that's what your mom did. You're also a jack of all trades, letting you add half your proficiency bonus to skills that you don't have proficiency with, meaning you don't have any negative modifiers anymore for skill checks. Remember how I said she's kind of good at everything? Well, there you go. For this level spell, Detect Magic lets you sense magical auras and what type of magic is causing them for up to 10 minutes. Look out for necromancy and transmutation. Those generally mean there's a boss fight coming up. Third level bards get to choose a college, and the College of Valor is kind of a party school, but you're still going to get a good education. You get combat inspiration, letting your allies add your inspiration die to damage rolls for bigger hits after you wink at them. They can also add it to their AC to protect themselves from oncoming attacks. Despite her cool demeanor, Bayo really does care about protecting the innocent. You can grab expertise and two skills of your choice. Perception and acrobatics would be my picks for now. The girl has her head on a swivel. It's one of the many pieces of her anatomy that don't make a lot of sense medically speaking. Of course, second level spells are also an option now. Hold person paralyzes a humanoid that fails a wisdom save for up to a minute, meaning every attack against them has advantage and automatically crits if it hits, in addition to stopping them from moving or taking actions. Hold them still, then hit them with some torture attacks. They've been very naughty. Finally, you get Necrotic Shroud as a third level Asimar, letting you force a wisdom save on creatures within 10 feet of you.
you, failing it, they're frightened by you until the end of your next turn. For the next minute, you also have spectral skeletal wings, or butterfly wings if your DM likes flavor, and you can add your level of necrotic damage to a spell or weapon attack once per round. Just add a little extra hair to the next hit, show them how wicked your weave can be. Fourth level bards get an ability score improvement. Round up your constitution and charisma for better casting and concentration. Both are pretty important to you. For this level spell, charm person forces a humanoid to make a wisdom saving throw, failing that they're charmed by you for an hour. This is a quintessential bard spell, and Bayonetta has a way of controlling others, but Step on Me isn't a spell. At least I don't think it is. Maybe it's in a new Unearthed Arcana I haven't seen yet. Fifth level bards get a font of inspiration, letting you recover your inspiration die on a short rest, and your inspo die increases to a d8. You can also learn third level spells. Slow got added to the bard list in a new Unearthed Arcana. Slow forces a wisdom save on up to six creatures in a 40 foot cube. Failing it, they have a negative two penalty to their AC and dexterity saves. Their speed is halved, and they can take an action or a bonus action on their turn, but not both. If they cast a spell, roll a d20. On an 11 or higher, they have to wait until the next turn to send the spell out, and must use the action to complete the spell. If you can stop them from doing so somehow, they just lose the slot. They can reroll the save at the end of their turn, but for now, put them in witch time and rack up some damage. For more damage, 6th level Valor Bards get an extra attack, letting you make 2 attacks instead of 1 with your action. You also get Counter Charm, letting you spend an action to give your allies advantage on saves against being charmed or frightened with some sweet dance moves. For this level spell, Bestow Curse forces a Wisdom save on a creature. Failing it, you can curse them to have disadvantage with checks and saves of one kind, disadvantage on attack rolls against you, make a Wisdom save every turn or do nothing, or take an extra D8 necrotic damage from each of your attacks. Unless someone removes the curse or you lose concentration, they're just stuck like that for a minute, letting you really ruin someone's day, or minute but a bad minute can ruin a day. Bouncing over to Warlock now, it seems like a pretty good fit for an Umber Witch, but which witch should we be? You certainly know your Fiends and Celestials, witches are pretty heavily tied to the Fae traditionally, but Hexblade is such a great catch-all patron for girls who really want to hit hard, so we're going with that. You get Hexblade's Curse, letting you curse a target as a bonus action, making your follow-up attacks deal extra damage equal to your proficiency bonus, and when you kill them, you get hit points back equal to your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier. This resets on long rest, so make sure you're getting 8 hours. You're also a Hex Warrior, letting you choose a weapon to use your Charisma modifier for in place of Dexterity or Strength. Currently, that can't be a two-handed weapon, but we'll fix that soon. For cantrips, we need guns, gun hands, gun shoes, heck, I'm pretty sure she has another gun hidden somewhere in her beehive hair. Eldritch Blast is a ranged spell attack, dealing 1d10 force damage. At this point, you've got two beams, and we'll get more as you level up. Remember, cantrips scale with your total level, not class level. Reflavoring guns and reflavoring Eldritch Blast are both staples of this channel, so reflavoring Eldritch Blast to be a reflavored gun is like a flavor explosion. Call Guy Fieri. For other cantrips, none of these are really sticking out, but True Strike forces a power builder to make a wisdom saving throw. Failing that, they'll scream at you until they're distracted by something shiny. But in game, it takes an action to give you advantage on your next attack roll. It requires your concentration, so it's really not good. There's almost no reason to use it other than to make your friend who takes the game way too seriously angry. For first level spells, Hexblades get some cool options. Shield bumps your AC by 5 as a reaction when someone attacks you. Wrathful Smite adds 1d6 psychic damage to your next melee attack. And forces a wisdom save on a creature you hit, failing it they're frightened of you for the next minute depending on your concentration. So hit harder and scare the pants off of the enemy. Now, multi-classing with Warlock is different than with other classes. You basically have all the slots you would from Bard and Warlock individually, but can cast Bard spells as Warlock spells and vice versa. So you've got a couple spell slots that recover on short rest from Warlock, that's the simplified explanation. Second level Warlocks can grab some invocations, which are basically little mini feats. Armor of Shadows lets you cast Major Armor at will, giving you AC equal to 13 plus your dexterity modifier, so your hair can keep you safe. Agonizing Blast lets you add your charisma modifier to damage with your Eldritch Blast shoe guns, making you deadly at any range. Third level Warlocks can learn second level spells. Misty Step lets you teleport 30 feet as a bonus action. That movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks, so turn into a bunch of bats and reform yourself a safe distance away. You also get a Pact Boon, a gift from whatever weird patron you signed up with that turned your hair into a Swiss Army knife of murder. Pact of the Blade lets you conjure a weapon as an action. You're automatically proficient with it. It's magical for overcoming resistances, and you can pick a new weapon by bonding with it at a short rest. This also means that you can have a two-handed hex warrior weapon, so even a great axe made out of your hair is an option. Fourth level warlocks get an ability score improvement or a feat, and the warcaster feat will make sure your feet are packing heat. With this, you can still use somatic components while you're using both of your hands, so you can two-hand a hair axe and still shoot your eldritch blasts. You also have advantage on concentration 
concentration saves, which is huge. You've got a ton of concentration spells, and you can make a spell as an opportunity attack instead of a weapon attack. Fifth level warlocks can learn third level spells. Blink from the Hexblade list lets you bamf in and out of the material plane. On each turn for a minute, roll a d20. With an 11 or higher, you wait in the ethereal plane until the start of your next turn, basically protecting you from any shenanigans that happen in the actual fight you are fighting in. You can also grab another invocation. Eldritch Smite lets you add a d8 of force damage to an attack with a packed weapon by spending a warlock slot, with the damage increasing for every spell level, so at this point it's 3d8. It also knocks the target prone if they're huge or smaller, so you can follow up with advantage and hopefully get a crit. Sixth level Hexblades get a Cursed Spectre, letting you turn one enemy you kill per long rest into a Spectre from the Monster Manual with extra HP equal to half your Warlock level and a bonus to attack rolls equal to your Charisma modifier. It's not super in character, but it's definitely helpful. We're mostly here for Warlock spells. Spells like Counterspell that automatically shut down spells of third level or higher as a reaction and can shut down higher level spells with a Charisma check equal to 10 plus the spell's level. As you scale it up, it can shut down higher level spells automatically, fourth with a 4th level slot, 5th with a 5th level slot, so on and so on. Sometimes the best offense is a good defense. 7th level warlocks can learn 4th level spells. Summon Greater Demon summons a demon of challenge rating 5 or lower. It obeys your commands for an hour as long as you maintain your concentration and it doesn't pass a charisma save. If that happens, it will attack any non-demon, including you, for 1d6 rounds or until it runs out of hit points. Sometimes delegation is the best strategy. You can also grab another invocation, Improved Packed Weapon, gives you plus 1 to attack and damage rolls with your packed weapon and allows you to make ranged weapons with your packed weapons as well. 8th level warlocks get an ability score improvement, cap your charisma for maximum casting and attacking. Hex Warrior really makes this the ideal class for a combat witch. Back over to bards, 7th level bards can learn 4th level spells. Polymorph lets you turn a creature you touch into a beast of challenge rating equal to their current one or their current level or lower. If they want to resist, they can with a wisdom save, but I'm thinking you should use this on yourself to turn into a panther or a giant ape. She doesn't turn into a giant ape in the games, but I'm sure there's an ape within. This makes your stats into the beast stats, including their HP and concentration. So it can be a great way to give yourself some extra HP if you're looking low. 8th level bards can get another ability score improvement, or full up on charisma, I'd buff dexterity for better AC with mage armor. For this level spell, freedom of movement lets a creature ignore difficult terrain, they can't be paralyzed or restrained, and nothing can reduce their movement speed for an hour. Pretty hard to hold a girl down who can just turn into bats and reform right next to you. Ninth level bards get to bump their song of rest up to a d8 and can learn fifth level spells. Hold monster is just like hold person without the humanoid restriction, so demons and angels can both enjoy your wicked weave. Did I say enjoy? I meant get destroyed by. Tenth level bards bump their inspiration dies to d10. They get expertise in two more skills, athletics and persuasion would be helpful, making you actually pretty capable of lifting things. You also get magical secrets, letting you learn two spells from any list. Haste is a third level spell that puts everyone in witch time, making you twice as fast. Doubling your movement speed, adding two to your AC, giving you advantage on deck saves and an extra action per turn for one attack, a dash, disengage or hide action. It lasts for a minute and requires concentration. No matter how it ends, you can't take actions or reactions for the next round as you need a second to process all the asses you've just kicked. Bigby's hand lets you summon a giant fist with 20 AC and as much HP as you have. Its strength is 26, its dexterity is 10, and you can move it 60 feet with a bonus action, then make it punch someone with a melee attack to deal 4d8 force damage, or make it push someone five times your charisma modifier plus five feet after succeeding an athletics check using the hand score so plus eight, with advantage if the creature is medium or smaller. It can grapple a creature and crush them on subsequent turns, dealing 2d6 plus your charisma modifier in damage, or give you half cover and prevent creatures of larger or smaller from moving through its spaces. It's a complicated spell. But should magic be complicated? 11th level bards can learn 6th level spells. Irresistible Dance lets you humiliate your enemies by forcing them to start dancing. It has to dance its first turn, and while dancing, it has disadvantage on dexterity saves and attack rolls. Creatures attacking it get advantage, they spend all of their movement dancing, and if they want it to end, they have to use their action to make a wisdom save. Your spell save is capped, so best of luck to them. This requires your concentration, but it's a really fun way to immobilize someone. Our capstone is bar level 12 for an ability score improvement. More dexterity will make you even more nimble. It stinks we can't cap it, but oh well. Guess you're just gonna have to make do with all of your other amazing spells and fighting skills. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you're a great fighter with multiple attacks, Hexblade's Curse, and Necrotic Shroud combining to let you deal 39 damage just from modifiers in one round, before adding any actual damage rolls. You've also got a spell list that makes you look good either by buffing yourself with haste 
or using bestow curse or slow to look better in comparison to your enemies. Finally, you can have plenty of fun out of combat with lots of skills, expertise, and role-playing spells to prevent fights altogether. For weaknesses, multi-classing casters this way prevents you from getting those big capstone spells and capstone slots, with your highest spell level being 6th. You're also dealing with lots of concentration spells. Maintaining them isn't the issue, it just means you've got to pick and choose which spells you're casting. Finally, your HP and AC are only both okay. Not bad at 150 and 17 respectively, but not where you want them to be if you're planning to play this like a frontline fighter. So, good thing you have shoe guns. Have some fun up front for a while, then run back and use your weird boot blasters. And be thankful you're not too powerful. The nerfing gun would ultimately leave you feeling weak. Thanks for watching. If you want to know what's coming up for December, join the Patreon for our monthly schedule updates. If you just want to see more Tulak, check out Tulak and Mango. It's where I play video games with my buddy Mango.